Hey everybody, welcome back to Anderton's TV and we have a transatlantic Zoom video coming up for you here because uh, Josh Turner is joining me today to talk about life, the universe, being a YouTuber, doing his bygones thing, uh, but most importantly, creating a cool new guitar with the guys at D'Angelico. So, hey Josh, thank you so much for joining us. Have we had hey, to Lee. get you out of bed super early this morning? A bit earlier than I might have ordinarily been out of bed, I admit, yeah. To, to, to be comfortable setting up all the stuff, you know, but yeah. Well, look, not too bad. thanks for joining. I see you're right in front of what looks like a pretty impressive record collection. Um, so I think that's probably where we'll start. Um, I've seen you doing your uh, YouTube thing online, a mixture of, of original songs and, and um, interpretations of other people's songs. Um, but whereabouts do you think your sort of musical influences have mainly come from? Well, um, like many people, music does run in my family. Uh, my Grandparents on my mom's side were both uh, professional musicians. They, they worked in the church and my grandpa conducted choirs and things like that. Uh, and so I was exposed to a pretty unusual and diverse range of musical influences from a young age just through what they were playing around their house, the CDs that they would lend to my parents. And then um, the other piece of the pie was that my, my dad was into you know classic rock, soft rock, Simon and Garfunkel, the Beatles, things like that. And so he played guitar for me when I was a kid, you know, he'd help me fall asleep. And so between those two universes, I, uh, I got curious about a lot of unusual things early on. Uh, I must admit, I, I think my playing guitar sends people to sleep sometimes as well. So I obviously have something in common with your dad. Uh, tell us about some, I mean, Simon Garfunkel, all that kind of stuff. Were you, were you drawn more to an acoustic thing growing up or, or is that, you know, just the acoustics just been something you've, you've gone to sort of later on in life? I was drawn to acoustic very early on. Yeah, I almost as soon as I started really, you know, when you when you when you start to like go through puberty, you're like 12, 13 and music starts to hit you in a different way. It was it was acoustic music that that did that for me. That was the first thing that I heard. And I was like, I, I just found an identity. It's this. I'm, I'm learning guitar, but unlike a lot of people, it wasn't, I'm going to pick up a Strat and start a rock band. It was, I'm going to learn every Paul Simon arrangement off of this album. I'm going to learn every Leo Kotke song that I can get my hands around. Um, I don't know. It's just one of those things where, where when you're drawn to it, you're drawn to it. It's always been acoustic for me. I came later to electric guitar and, and even still, this, is, this feels like home. Oh, that's cool. Now, you mentioned in the video... Um where you talk about the, the working with the guys at D'Angelico. And by the way, are you D'Angelico or D'Angelico? I've always said D'Angelico, but it's funny that you mentioned that because anytime that we shoot a product video together, uh, they, we have the same conversation. Whereas uh, me and the producers, they'll say to each other, now, are we saying D'Angelico or D'Angelico? So I don't think it's a totally settled issue, uh, and I don't think either is incorrect. I'm a, I'm a D'Angelico sayer personally. <sighs> See, I'm, I'm, I'm always the D apostrophe, so I'm a D'Addario, D'Angelico kind of guy, but I think it gets Americanized into D'Addario and D'Angelico, but whatever. We'll have to, he's no you're, longer you're around to ask, right. is he? So as long as we know what we're talking about. But yeah, you, you mentioned in the launch video about that, that you owned um, some other nice acoustic guitars. And I think, you know, given that we're a sort of a gear review channel, it's always fun to sort of dig into what those inspirations were. So tell us about some of the guitars that you've owned or still own and, and you know, what it was that uh, particularly appealed about those to you. So my, my first guitar that I was very, very lucky to have as a first instrument um, that I still have and love is a Martin Triple 28, Triple uh, 28 Herringbone that was built in 2001. Um, I knew that Paul Simon had been playing a triple O 28 for a while. I knew that Nick Drake at the end of his career had had a triple O 28. And so I kind of had my heart set on the Martin triple O world. Uh, and I went to a guitar store called the Music Emporium in Boston. That's a incredible dealer of Martins and other, um, high end instruments and was able to kind of take my pick of triple O instruments. And I found this one that was used and that's been my main guitar for, for years and years is that triple O 28. Um, it was even the name of my channel for a long time before my YouTube channel was called Josh Turner guitar. It was called two zero 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 two eight, which is just 2000 triple O 28 because that's the year it was built. Actually, I later discovered that I was wrong about that and I had named my channel erroneously for years, but, um, 
that was my main guitar. That was the main inspiration for this. Um, and then a couple of years ago, I was on tour, and uh, I have some really amazing fans who found me, mostly through YouTube, many of whom are guitarists themselves, and in some cases who are luthiers. And uh, a gentleman from Georgia reached out to me just via a cold email and said, hey, I've, I've got some refurbished um, harmony guitars that I would like to bestow upon you. And so, you know, that is an amazing offer. And so we, we went off the highway out into the deep countryside of uh, Georgia. And this guy had a shed out back of his house that was not climate controlled, where he was taking old Stella and Harmony catalog guitars, taking them apart, uh, refitting them with uh, much finer bracing and reshaping the necks and redoing the frets and so on, and then putting them back together. And so he gave me a 1961 Harmony H162, um, which is another OM, triple O style guitar uh, with a spruce top and mahogany back and sides, just like this one. And whatever he had done into it had, had done to it had just breathed unbelievable life into this instrument. It was, uh, it was just really loud, had a huge bass response for such a small guitar, very comfortable to play. And so that, plus my Martin, then became the two, I wanted to kind of capture the best of both worlds of those of those two instruments as I was trying to uh, work on this one. I have other guitars now, luckily, that I really love. I've got a, a 69 Martin D3512 that is maybe my maybe my most special instrument, um, but it wasn't really a logical thing to draw from for a signature model. Um, so so yeah, it was it was those two guitars primarily, the Harmony and the and the Triple O Twenty Eight that uh, had a a weird baby, and then the, the third element was that I wanted to make it more accessible and affordable than than either of those because because I know that many of my fans play guitar themselves and I didn't want to make something that was just for the you know the five people who could afford it. I wanted something. I get a lot of questions on the YouTube channel about like, hey, what do you recommend for a beginning guitarist or an intermediate guitarist looking for their first like real instrument? I wanted to make something that was an answer to that question. Did you, you know, was it a fun kind of geeking out journey of looking at the um, specification of what it was about um, the, the Martins or perhaps most interestingly, what the guy was doing to those old harmony guitars? Because I know I've got some old catalog acoustics from probably a similar era and they've got very very heavy bracing that really doesn't let the guitar kind of sing or anything like that so they have they have a certain sound um, that as soon as you get into something like an x-braced scallop martin or something like that all of a sudden you you, you begin to realize how important certain design elements are if you're trying to achieve a certain tone from a guitar so what, what, what did you, did you, did you go on a sort of a proper geek out journey of, of spec and features? Um, or was it something that D'Angelico were able to sort of guide you through, you know, just understanding words and tones that you wanted and they were able to interpret that into features and spec? Um, it was, it was a combination effort. I think the, a lot of the stuff was very obvious in the ways that you sort of indicated. It's like we're not going to put ladder bracing in it. You know, we're not going to we're not going to have a baseball bat size neck like you get on on some of those old guitars. Um, some of the nuts and bolts were sort of self explanatory. I knew that I wanted a scale length that was close to my Triple O Twenty Eight. I like something a little bit shorter than a usual OM scale length, um, just because that's what I've always uh, kind of grown up on, and I like the floppiness of it and luckily D'Angelico does something slightly shorter than a standard OM and so we just stuck with their uh, we stuck with their normal scale length I knew that I wanted the same I wanted most of the aspects of the neck to be very reminiscent of my Martin and the Martin has done a, a, a thousand neck shapes over the years you know every, everyone is different we got uh, as close as we realistically could without delaying the project by years, you know, uh, trying to trying to get the neck shape of this guitar to be similar to this particular Martin that I have from the early 2000s, um, which led us to the wider nut spacing. It led us to a slightly uh, deeper profile. Um, and that was, was all that stuff. Like I was just like, I want it like this. Like this is very straight ahead. There's not much figuring out to do here. I know we want scalloped X bracing. That's that's the standard. My Martin has scalloped X bracing. The Harmony had been refitted with scalloped X bracing. That was a common thread between those two. 
I knew I wanted a spruce top because, you know, spruce top. And, uh, and then I went for laminate back and sides. Uh, I was on the fence about this a little bit, but, um, I went for laminate back and sides, uh, you know, partially because, you know, in my heart that really D'Angelico was not driving the train on designing it to a price. I was the one who wanted to keep it affordable. And I have a couple of laminate back and side guitars that play great, that sound great, that have a lot of power and, um, and you know they they may lack a tiny bit of the nuance of the all solid instruments, but for all intents and purposes they're great. So I I said that I wanted to do laminate back and sides, and past that point it doesn't. I don't think it has as big of a role in the tone of an instrument once you go to laminate. So with that in mind, I chose mahogany because um, when you do an open pour finish, which I know I wanted, I think mahogany just looks incredible. So um, so yeah. So then past that point, it was just me saying to D'Angelico. What can we strip away? Because I think that over the years, D'Angelico has brought a lot of the same design language from their archtop guitars and their uh, semi-hollows and so on into their acoustic line. And I think that in some cases, it's more than an acoustic guitar needs. And, uh, and so, yeah, so it, the first part was, here's my laundry list. I want this string spacing, this bracing, blah, blah, blah. The second part was, what can we get rid of? And uh, how light can we build this? So this, this, I think, is like, I think this is the lightest built acoustic that they've ever done. The top is a little bit thinner. The finish is the thinnest that they had done up to that point. Um, it feels very light to hold. And that's something that I've always loved about vintage guitars is... Uh, that there's very little mass that that can stop the top from from vibrating, and that was some that was one of the chief things that I wanted to capture, and I think we really succeeded there. I'm going to ask a little bit about what the decision was around why D'Angelico as opposed to another builder, but but for 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 a nice kind of break here, could we just hear a little bit? I mean, are you comfortable, more comfortable doing sort of strummy stuff on there, or finger picking, or what's what's your sort of go to? style or is it a bit of everything? Um, it's a bit of everything for me. Yeah, I started out in the fingerstyle world. Um, so yeah, I'll play you some fingerstyle mm -hmm. here. Um, uh, Davy Graham was a big early inspiration of mine. He still doesn't get as much love on the side of the pond as I think he ought to, but uh, he's got a record from 1978 called The Complete Guitarist uh, that was very formative for me and I'll play you uh, one of the tunes off of that. It's an arrangement of a um, traditional Irish air called Lord Mayo. Beautiful. I mean, uh, lovely. You can see a whole melting pot of influences going into putting a song together like that from classical through to, you know, folky kind of stuff. Um, if you're going to approach a tune like that with all those kind of hammer-ons and, and pull-offs and stuff, presumably getting the action low uh, was a really, really critical part of the design element. And I always kind of feel um, sometimes if you're going if you look at a lot of the Martin stuff, a really low action isn't necessarily something you always associate with those guitars. So how did you kind of address that with the D'Angelico guys? Well, it's interesting you say that actually. Um, the I'm, I'm constantly in a conversation with uh, the tech who, who works, uh, who, the main tech in New York who works for D'Angelico because he likes his guitars much more low setup than I do. Um, the ones that we're shipping, I think, strike a really good middle ground that leans a little bit more towards fingerstyle for where they're set up. But I actually um, 
do a decent amount of flat picking and bluegrass type stuff in addition to the finger style. So I like my action more what we might call medium, I mm-hmm. think. Um, I think even when you're doing hammer-ons and pull-offs and frilly things like that, it uh, it makes them articulate much more clearly. And if you have a little bit more travel, then you can actually get more volume out of it. Uh, and it takes a little bit of getting used to it first, but if you start to... D- it gives you more headroom, you know? If, as you start to dig in on the acoustic guitar, uh, this guitar naturally has a lot of headroom. You can play it louder and louder, and it responds, which not all guitars do, but you can really only... Uh, make use of the full extent of that if the if you're not fretting out every time you dig into a chord. So, so I like my action a little bit higher actually, um, and I think that is probably something that I picked up from the from the Martin universe. Um, although, as I said, the ones that we're shipping are a little bit more uh, a little bit more user friendly, and of course, people can just shim it if they want to. I'd love to hear a bit of flat picking if you can do that. I mean, I I always kind of feel, you know, those guitar players probably don't get the credit that they deserve in the world of guitars because it's some of the most insane technique ever on a guitar but yeah i i think it's a anyway let's have a little listen to so you're going back to a standard tuning now yeah yeah great you have an impressive stretch uh on the your left hand there there's yeah that is that is impressive um and again i think it's one of the things that i wish we had more in the uk was the idea of being able to go to a bar and seeing two or three people sitting on stage you know playing that kind of stuff together i I only really ever get to see it on youtube and watching molly tuttle or billy strings or you know it's like and it's just you know, and you're a great player, but they're they're playing that on like speed, aren't they? It's just like oh, lunatic yeah. speed. Um, yeah, it's but, like you take what I just did and put the YouTube 1.75 <laughs> playback on, and that's that's what they're doing. You know. So okay, so it's clearly a versatile guitar, um, and as you say, you know, you've hit a, a, a price point. Um, so o- over in Europe, they're 7.99. So it's kind of maybe not a guitar that someone would learn to play on, but it's absolutely an affordable uh, guitar for like a, an intermediate sort of guitar player. Um, but tell me about the, the D'Angelico Association then, because I think it's probably fair to say maybe some people might not even realize D'Angelico make acoustic guitars. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. Um, so the, the D'Angelico Association, the D'Angelico Association came about... Uh, just because I have been living in New York for about seven and a half years now, and they are obviously a New York-based company. They have a strong New York lineage. You know, they're manufacturing overseas at this point, but it's, I think that their heart and soul is still very much here. And they're always looking for people who can come to their showroom in Manhattan and demo their instruments. And that was how the relationship began several years ago. I came in and I did promotional videos for some of their standard line models at the time that were available. And uh, I'm a both a very strongly opinionated person and a person who is uh, not afraid to share their opinions. And so I'm sure that while I was there at some point, so I, I was like, you know, you really have to think about blah, 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 um, which could have been perceived as a bit out of line and, and even obnoxious. But luckily, the folks at D'Angelico did not perceive it that way. And after several years uh, of us working together, they approached me and said, hey, would you have any interest in doing a signature model? We, we they, at the time, weren't really doing that. It wasn't very common. Uh, in, in the intervening years, they've come out with a few more, like the Eric Krasno that I think you uh, were recently discussing on the show. But uh, I was, I think, one of the first people that they approached about it. And I think that there was a mutual opportunity wherein uh, it's an honor for anybody to ever be asked to make a signature guitar for me. And for them, they, I think, understand that they're not still to this day known very much as an acoustic guitar company. 
and uh, and saw an opportunity to you know put something out there that uh, had a had a real stamp of you know approval on it and so you know I had a little bit of trepidation at first because they're not primarily known as an acoustic guitar company and because I'm coming from uh, very fancy and expensive instruments for the most part but I also saw it as an opportunity uh, to try something really different with them and see if they would be responsive to it and uh, and work with me to get outside of kind of both of our comfort zones in terms of what an ideal product would look like. And uh, to my delight, they very much were. I think uh, there were a lot of things that were new about this guitar to them that they have uh, now started to implement in some of their other acoustic models. And uh, I think it's... Yeah, I, I'll be totally honest. I think that their acoustics were a mixed bag uh, historically, but this is this is one that I feel very confident putting my name on. And uh, so yeah, I, I'm I'm glad to be I'm glad to help be a person that that brings legitimacy to the and uh, knowledge to the the D'Angelico acoustic line. It's I, I think that your point there. I don't know that I've ever seen D'Angelico acoustics as hit and miss necessarily, but certainly. A little bit homogenous. It was just here's our dreadnought. Here's our, you know, it's like, and and I think it's nice to see. And every brand I think needs somehow to understand what identity they're trying to put behind the product. Because if it's just a copy of a copy of a copy, it almost becomes like, well, so what in the end, doesn't it? But one of the things I've always loved about D'Angelico is the um, nod to New York in some of the design, the aesthetic design details. Um, th they always have a killer looking headstock. The truss rod cover always looks cool. I know you've gone for perhaps some slightly um, plainer inlays and stuff on there, but um, what, what have you got on there that's kind of properly New York? Looks like the bridge maybe. Yeah, so we stuck with the uh, the Art Deco bridge that they've got on on all of their acoustics, which uh, which I I really like. I like it a lot. I think it's very very pretty, very elegant. Um, and then we've got the the sort of scroll style uh, headstock with the Empire State Building nod there on the truss rod cover, and uh, and then for the inlays, I wanted something that that lived in the same sort of Art Deco world, but was just as pared back as possible, uh, because I always feel I don't know. Anytime that you can see like a natural wood finish, and then there's a ton of abalone on a guitar, it's just there's a there's a dissonance there to my brain. So I, I wanted to keep it very minimal. I wanted to highlight the the ebony on the on the fretboard more so than the than the inlay work. And so we uh, this this was the first that D'Angelico had done this. It's just a very simple diamond pattern on there with a double diamond at the uh, oh sorry at the 12th yeah fret. okay they, when it was further back they just looked round to me but I can see that now. So yeah it's a it's a very pretty looking guitar. Um, Thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, your musical projects and perhaps bygones uh, specifically. Um, that's something, was that always a kind of a, was YouTube always a means to an end to sort of promote uh, some sort of musical project like that? Or has bygones kind of happened out of the opportunities that have arisen through doing the YouTube thing? Very much the latter. I started my YouTube channel in 2007. Uh, I was 15 years old, and I had no ambitions and no idea. You know, what I was you know doing that means whatsoever. you've been alive longer on YouTube than n not. If that makes sense. It, no, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I've spent more of my life now on YouTube than than not on it. <laughs> um, which is a. Uh, I try not to think about that. Yeah, too don't long. think about that. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I am I am happy to say that that YouTube was a was a, a gentler, uh, I think more benevolent and a little bit weirder place back in two thousand and seven than it is now, um, because there was no money to be made there. Yeah, and so it was this incredible place for people to just throw stuff at the wall and and see what stuck, and uh, and that was very much what I was doing. I I started my channel just to post covers of. Mostly fingerstyle guitarists that I that I really admired. I mentioned Leo Kotke earlier. Many of my early videos were covers of of Leo Kotke's repertoire, and uh, and it was validating to me as a teenager to have strangers from all over the world say, "Hey, hey, good going, kid! Like, keep at it." And so I stuck with it, and I I eventually parlayed it into a means of uh, social interaction. You know, I I moved to a new state shortly after I started my channel, uh, and would invite 
friends over on the on the basis of making something for YouTube. There was no pressure. There was no money. There was no like, oh, are we going to get the clicks? It was just here's a reason for us to hang out. You know, I don't I don't enjoy sports or, or whatever, and I don't particularly enjoy video games. So that was a great reason to to make friends was, and it was something to orient my time around. Um, and then as I got into college, some of my videos started to go viral. The algorithm started to change in a way that, that seemed to favor what I was doing. And I really just backed my way into most of the success that I've had on YouTube. I mean, I, I've been very vigilant about it. I've kept a pace of about three videos a month straight through from 2007. Um, but it was never with the, with the end goal of, okay, this, this is going to be how, how I take my career to the next level. That was, that was never really how it was until I graduated from college and realized that it was my only uh, legitimate professional prospect and my entire portfolio was a musician. So, uh, from that point I, I started a Patreon channel, uh, and I started to be a little bit more strategic about what I was making and how I was making it. And then I started to consider the possibility of uh, touring in support of the collaborations that I was doing on YouTube. So for a long time, I was touring as part of a duo called The Other Favorites. Um, Carson and I, the other musician there, uh, we were still very good friends, but we're on a hiatus from touring. Um, he and I, he was in some of my very first videos back in 2007. And, uh, and then in 2018, when I was touring for something else, I met a singer out of Nashville named Allison Young, um, and she contacted me, said, hey, do you want to collaborate on something? And uh, so we made a video. It was very successful. So that sort of begat another video and another video. And uh, and yeah, now it's gotten to the point that we uh, are doing a full length album of original music that we're going to start recording later this week. As a matter of fact, um, we've just done a very successful Kickstarter campaign. And we're touring the U.S. in the spring of next year and hopefully the U.K. Uh, in the summer. Oh, that would be amazing. So we might get to see you in the flesh in summer 2024. Yeah, hopefully so. Oh, I yeah, would, uh, but I really can't stress enough the extent to which it's all been by accident. Oh, uh, <laughs> At least that's how it feels to me. No, that would be very, very cool. And, and again, I, I, it's always... You know, always slightly odd when you when I'm sort of talking to someone else. You know, who's got a massive channel as well. I'm sure there'll be lots of people who are watching this or who are more familiar with you already, and then there'll be people who are to, you know here to sort of perhaps just discover new music and see what it is. Is there anything for the people that haven't seen? Is bygones very much um, keeping within that sort of folky uh, acoustic? sort of stripped back kind of thing or are you experimenting with new sort of styles of music and stuff it's going to be a little bit of a mix of both uh the so allison and i put out an ep under just our respective names we hadn't chosen the bygones name yet and we were still in the uh, in the beta phase uh last year and that i think sounded very squarely like what people expect on the channel which is two people sat in front of microphones doing complete takes no overdubs Two guitars, vocal harmonies, uh, a very a very purist sort of sort of thing, and Allison and I really enjoy that type of music making. And there, you know, it's there are fewer people who do that well than there are people who do full band music well. However, our curiosity sort of stretches beyond that, and so we're trying to allow ourselves to do whatever feels fun on this new project, in including some of that, and then also including some some more full band stuff. We'll be probably drawing on some indie rock inspiration, um, some, some country music, you know, some, some straight ahead folk, um, and some jazz as well, uh, which, which are the parts of our musical Venn diagram that I think align the most closely. Uh, so, so, so yeah, all the things that I've covered over the years on my channel are now, um, the ingredients going into the, the soup pot of original music that I'm, <laughs> that I'm working on. Well, I mean, I, I always think, you know, congratulations for all the success you've achieved uh, across YouTube. It's, it's always kind of, I think sometimes perhaps more in the early days, people got referred to as YouTubers as opposed to musicians, you know, somehow or other because you were making music or, or on YouTube, you weren't the same as a musician who didn't use YouTube. But I think now... It I, just, still, I still feel a certain sense of insecurity around that, actually, but... Yeah, well, I guess because you, you, you've been there right from day one virtually with YouTube. But I, I I think it's nice now. I think generally speaking, people see YouTube as the same as just turning on the radio now. It's a way of discovering new music and, and you know, there's some really talented people out there. Um, so congratulations on 
on, on all that success and, and doing the guitar with D'Angelico, it looks really cool. Uh, the reason I don't have one here today is we totally underestimated how popular it would be and have completely sold out of, of all the guitars we ordered from uh, D'Angelico the first time, which, it, which again, it wasn't an insignificant number. I think, I think we had 25 or something on the first batch and they've all gone already. So there are some more coming, which is good, and people will be able to find that in the links below. And I'm sure if you go to Josh's, Josh's that's difficult to say. Josh's channel, uh, you can find out where you could buy them in, in the US and around the world. Um, I think we should end this though with, I'm really, I keep looking at this record collection and I always think it's like, it's the measure of a man. It's like, what's actually in there? So you're not allowed to cheat here. I want you to go to top shelf and pull out the 14th record along from the left. You cannot, I just want to see what it is. This is where we find out that this is um, Banana Rama's greatest hits and all your credibility goes out the window. So uh, let's see here. <laughs> Stan Getz and Lorindo Almedio. Wow, he's so. super cool. He's way cooler than I even thought he would have been. Right, but just in case this is a fluke, what's the eighth from the right on the bottom shelf? Eighth from the right on the bottom, let's see. Um. <laughs> David Grisman, Quintet 80. Oh man, it's a fix. Nobody can be that cool. Anyway, look, there we are. You passed. Congratulations. You are officially cool Thanks, on Lee. the guitar and on YouTube. So uh, thank you so much for, for getting up early and joining us this morning. Uh, again, good luck with, with the guitar and all your future projects. Please come and see us if you are in the UK. We're not far from London. Oh, so. I, I insist on it. I'll be darkening your doorstep in, uh, right. in no time. Thanks for having me, Lee. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for watching and we'll see you next time.